time to get super excited with Casey Lau. Hey everyone, Casey Lau here with another episode. Today, my guest is Harry Mann, founding partner at Matrix Partners China. Harry, how are you doing? Very good. Thanks for inviting me. I know. It's so good to see you. We've known each other for a while. I'm glad to be able to get you into the podcast room here and just talk a little bit about China, a little yep. bit of Web3, Hong Kong, yes. how much we love it, how, how, how it's bouncing back now in the tech scene. Um, talk a little bit about, maybe we'll start off, you are originally from Hong Kong, yes. right? Yes. Born and raised in Hong Kong. You know, I, I've been... Spending the initial half of my life in Hong Kong, and then I went to the States for my college. Mm -hmm. And then pretty much afterwards, I've been living and working in China. Now I've been working and living in China for 23 years. Wow. Is that it's longer than long. you've been? Longer long? than I've been in Hong Kong. Okay, same same yeah. for me. I've been here in Hong Kong longer than I've been in Canada. Yes. So it's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and then, you know, just a little bit of context. So you've been working in Web 1, Web 2, and now That's Web right. 3. <laughs> and But Web 1, you worked for a company called China.com here in Hong Kong. I am uh, so amazed that you still remember this company. <laughs> yes, yep. yes, it yep. is. One of the first few, um, I would say, Web 1.0 or portal companies yep. got listed right. uh, in China in the U.S. stock exchange. Yeah. Yep. And what did you do there? Yeah, I, I, I was lucky enough to be in the investment team. Okay. So I started off joining the business development team and then got recruited into the investment team. Yeah. So that's how I got into the, in into the industry. Yeah. So I've been investing into tech, into dot-coms, into uh, technology in China yeah. uh, since then. So year 2000 okay. is okay. when I started. So wow. for the last 23 years. So that's why. So that makes an easy transition to get start your own firm in China called Matrix, right? That's not easy. Okay. But um, it was natural. You know, my, my career was like that. You know, I've been working, living in China for 23 years, always in tech, always in investment. Yeah. Uh, the first half part of it, the first six years, I worked for two U.S. listed companies, both were Chinese companies, uh, but I was the head of the investment teams. And then in year 2006-ish, um, China VC started to boom. Yeah. And then uh, I was lucky enough to join the team, and then I started my VC career. Oh wow! And then um, you know, one year, two years afterwards, we worked together with what what Matrix today, yep. and then found the Matrix in um, early two thousand eight. Okay, and that's that got history. nothing to do with the Matrix, the movie. Nothing to do. I mean, <laughs> Matrix US ha it's a firm yep, that has right. been around for forty five years. Right, right. So they were before the Matrix movie. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> to be exact. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, totally understand. And then. Uh, what do you when you so when you move from Hong Kong to you know mainland and yeah. you know what at the beginning how do you see the difference between then and like kind of now I mean there obviously is it a was massive hush, uh, yeah twenty three sure. years ago sure. you know it's like we'll, fifty years or hundred years ago in other I cities know, right I know you feel like it's yeah. hundred years ago yeah. you know people still ride horses yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right not exactly right, but right. you know there was limited entertainment yeah. there were like all the cars were black yeah there were no colorful cars and you know right. that there's nothing right. uh, but you know you know ever since then has been evolved evolving quite fast so fast yeah, yeah so fast so fast yeah yeah since the, i think because the advent of the smartphone iphone right as the yep. iphone the android phones got more popular more stuff happened i think that's what i saw a big ramp yes in, in those years the since. first 10 years was low growth yeah uh, of the china the, the economy has been growing but really takes off in 2010 yeah. You know, when iPhone uh, and, yeah. you know, App Store, Android yeah. came into China, yeah. smartphone, yeah. Um, you know, economy has been evolving and yeah. then the entire ecosystem changed. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. I mean, right now, living in China, can I say that? It's more comfortable than living in Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> People yeah. are so lazy, so yeah. spoiled by all the applications that have been built. Yeah. You know, you just sit there, coffee comes to you. You sit there, massage comes to you. You sit there, you know, your grocery comes to you. Everything just works like that. Wow. I remember one VC we had at Rise one year. Uh -huh. They asked him, what are you investing in? He's like, anything for lazy people. Yes. <laughs> That's like, what everybody doing. laugh like crazy at that, and, but it's true. It is true. It wow. is true. People are really spoiled, but that creates a big economy yeah. uh, for, for China and Chinese investing. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at some of those companies. Uh, yep. your, your lazy person investment uh, <laughs> portfolio, right? The first one is called Ellie.me. Uh Proper pronunciation is called Olama. Olama. Olama okay, in Ulema. Chinese is uh, sounds like it's is are you hungry? Are you hungry? So it yeah. is like a delivery for China. It is. Okay, it but is. it's uh, obviously much bigger. Um, that's a delivery service of food. So yep. uh, how about the how does that work? Right, the logistics of that because you know I've been to China and some mm -hmm. cities are quite small and uh, the streets don't actually line up properly. Yep, yep, yep. Like how do they? How do you go over those I, kind I of things? I think that started off with just one um, fast food shop. They try to help them to deliver the the, the, the meals to um you know to to the customers. Yeah. And then that evolved over time. Yeah. Into 
millions of riders in China riding scooters and yeah. bicycles and delivering yeah. food to your door. They're like a gang. They're a gang of riders all I, wearing I think, the logo. You know, in, to some extent, they employ more people than you know the proper SOEs in town, yeah. Yeah. right? And it's creating a brand new, I would say, self economy. Yeah. Uh, people rather work in as a delivery guy than working in, I would say, uh, a factory now. Yeah. Right. The younger generation, Amazing. because they can be live in the first tier cities. Yeah. They can go around. They enjoy a lot of more stuff instead of doing, you know, the hardcore work. You know, uh, you know, repeating day in day out. Very, very different. And then, so how do they? Uh, just this is a side question. It's like, how do they? Because the density is so huge, right? Yes. Like a building in Hong Kong will have thirty floors, but I think in China they have even more or more mm -hmm, mm -hmm. apartments. So I guess people ordering. Say McDonald's because we know yep. McDonald's is in China. <laughs> Maybe there's 20 orders or more going yeah. to that same building at mm -hmm. lunchtime. Is that how it works? That is exactly how it works. Wow. I think they they pack into batches. Yeah, you know, per per delivery guy, they have a big box, likely that big, to have five six orders, and then they go around for half an hour. Yeah, you know, send out all the stuff, and then come back to pick up the next batch. Wow, that's just crazy. That's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. And so that, but that market's pretty sophisticated now, right? Very. There's sophisticated. nobody else coming into the market. Nobody's launching a new because well, I was in Vancouver. now is Olama and Meituan, okay, which Meituan, are the two yeah. competitors still yeah. working fiercely, competing with each other. Okay, still today. Um, wow, still today. Wow. Still today. Yeah, it's funny because I went to Vancouver and I feel like it's still uh, it's still happening. Mm. There is a uh, Fan Tuan, which yep. is a Chinese food or Asian food only. only Chinese food okay. only. Okay. So I was like, wow, that's a very specific segment, <laughs> as well as ride sharing, where okay. the drivers all speak Mandarin. And okay. that's it. So you can use Uber if you speak any other language. But if you if want to you speak, want Chinese drivers, you use this that, special right? one. Yeah, really? Is that amazing? Wow. I know. Okay. It's so crazy. So, 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 you know, that 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 um, that is a clear indication of how spoiled Chinese people are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want China Chinese drivers only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> and you right. create an F for it. <laughs> right, right, right. You also came in early on Didi, right? Yes. We're the first round investor. Of Didi, Didi is the yeah. Uber of China. The Uber of China. Bought China. out Uber that went, right. went to China. Fierce competition. Yeah. DD, uh, there was another company called Kuaidi, the two merges, yeah. and then they bought out Uber of China yeah. and now become kind of like the biggest uh, yeah. in, the, in the Chinese taxi handling market. And then, but it's like a, their app is more than just a ride sharing app. They, it does a lot of other stuff. A right? lot of other stuff. One thing that only China has, but not in the rest of the yeah. world, is uh, you can order a driver yeah. to drive yourself home. What? Yeah. Um, you've not heard of it? No. Like, you know, we go to work, yeah. right? Day to day basis. I drive my own car. <laughs> what if there's a dinner, right? And then you're drunk. You don't want to get, get caught drunk driving, right? So, and you don't want to leave your car in the parking lot overnight. So the, the perfect solution is there, there is like millions of, um, you know, taxi drivers out there. You push a button and then he comes to you in five minutes. He drives you and your car. In your car. And your car back home. Amazing. Yeah, that that's that's this amazing, I would say, invention that China only. I hope that they can have it in Hong Kong. <laughs> and it, it does, so it's a DD, then that market's also saturated too, right? There's nobody else there, getting there, involved. There's there. a, quite a lot of people coming in. You know, DD actually suffers quite a bit in oh. the last two years because okay. of the, um, you know, the regulations. Mm -hmm. They were not allowed to, 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 to get for new users, re new users registration. Right. So the market share has been down a little bit, yeah. uh, but now they're back up in the market and competing with the other smaller guys, but they're still the majority yeah. market owner, uh, but not the monopoly. Oh, the okay. Uh, that used to be, yeah, right? It yeah. used to be the monopoly. Oh, wow. The Did, is China like different enough that there can be a new player come into the market with new technology or a new gimmick mm. and can kind of overthrow the last guy? Because, you know, like eBay in the States is still like the, the place I, to I, go. I think it would be very hard because all these, what that we, what we talked about has very strong network effect, mm. right? Once you have enough drivers and enough customers, your network effect really happens, right? If you want to create a new app, you have five drivers, you have to wait for 15 minutes, half an hour for, right. for that. Right. So to get over to that network effect is yeah. actually very, very tough. So that's why, you know, we invest in that kind of technology because that that's the boundary, not really the services that you offer, yeah. but really the network effect that you're, that you're building. Yeah, yeah. But now that, you know, with DD back out for about a year and a half because of regulations, there are a couple guys coming in oh. and uh, competing now that they own about, I don't know, 20, 30% of the market share right, right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, decent, but not large. Yeah, not large, yeah. but still able to but maybe- But still able to navigate themselves yeah. to yeah. Uh, to compete yeah. uh, with, with, uh, with DD. Okay, another one that you invested in an early stage, 
that actually went IPO in three years of launch, right, is Momo. Yes. Right? So Momo is like a, I don't know how to explain it because it's very unique. But there's no equivalent, but it's like a, I guess you could say like a Tinder and a WhatsApp. Yeah, kind a combination of, of that. So yeah. the idea is that it doesn't have to use a signal. You can just talk to people. It's um, a text messaging. Put it, put it that way. It's more like a location-based yeah. uh, social networking okay. uh, mobile solution. So that seems the social graph will just jump yeah, immediately. You, you lock onto quick. your phone and then you find friends around you and chit chat with them yeah. and then make friends. And then eventually that evolve into a lot of more well, other things, including live streaming. Yeah. Yeah. That has oh, been okay. so big for them. They actually did not invent the live streaming, but they were currently one of the biggest uh, market share of live streaming uh, oh. of Momo and the wow. major revenue contribution of that. Wow. Wow. Okay. So wait a minute. You're saying that people would just text each other? Yeah. Some stranger next to them in the, yeah, in the yeah, vicinity? Yeah, yeah. That's right. I mean, everybody, you know, wants to get to know more people, especially when you move to Beijing, you know, you don't have enough friends. You want to make more friends online, just like back in the days on QQ, sure, sure. on ICQ, that okay, you sure. make friends with other people. Okay. That's the mobile version of it. But okay. with location-based, yeah. you get to know people that are close by to you, okay. have similar interests, I, and I, go to the same places. That's why I never took off in Hong Kong. Nobody wants to text some stranger <laughs> here. If I was at Starbucks and somebody started texting me, I'd be like, Who's this? Yeah, What's yeah, yeah. On? But it's very popular in China. Okay, very interesting. In China. That's a cultural at, difference. At that particular point in growth, yeah. because they started off in year 2010 or 11, yeah. right at the point when iPhone uh, took off yeah, and yeah. then WeChat took off. So yeah. people want a lot more fun and interactive you know, uh, uh, applications apps, to play yeah. with. And yeah. that was the perfect time for it. Oh. You know, as about us Chinese nowadays, you know, 11 years from then, yeah. different, yeah. right? So, but um, 10 years back then. Is it was social like, audio anything in China? Like, you know, the Clubhouse and Twitter spaces, is that, that a thing? There were ups and down, you know, yeah. that, that there were uh, companies that tried to do that, yeah. but never took off big. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that was quite interesting. Because people I mean. don't want to maybe talk publicly I, on something. I, I think that's one reason. Okay. Another thing is like, you know, chit chatting with people, it's, you know, the, 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 the barrier to entry is a lot more lower. You okay. can say, hello, how are you? Yeah, how yeah, are you? Yeah. If you want to create kind of like a verbal social, um, you know, uh, uh, networking with, with, proper contacts right like you know clubhouse and things like that yeah. is a, you, the bar is super high yeah you need a lot of like semi-professionals to really run okay, it. okay interesting, interesting it's just different different market interesting it's not for fun it's not for it's fun, not for fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay and then you also invest in two of the biggest uh, ev companies in yes. china xpeng but it's not called xpeng it's called xiaopeng xiaopeng okay yeah and, and li auto is called okay. li shang li shang okay. yeah there are two there were two out of the three initial uh, I would say biggest uh, EV company startups in China. Right. right. Yeah. They they're also you know um, uh, I I would say super successful. Yeah. Uh, they both got listed about four to five years yeah. uh, after they started. Yeah. Uh, S and EV company yeah. deep tech is yeah. actually very very hard. Yeah. And they really took off in in, in the industry. Yeah. Now that these two companies are all performing really really well. Okay. So let's give a little context how well they're performing in comparison to like say a Tesla in the states. Um, like they're everywhere, right? Li Xiang, they created an SUV, okay, uh, or a series of SUVs, a series of a SUVs, series of SUV, and now they are the most popular SUV in China. Wow! Period. Wow! For the last fully electric, full uh, or not, hybrid? Not yet. It's okay, hybrid. hybrid. Okay. Uh, Li Auto's uh, version is hybrid. They're okay. moving into fully electric. Okay. Uh, Xiaopeng is full electric uh, from day one. Yeah. So and uh, but 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 nowadays there are like 20, 30 newcomers coming in, but uh, Li Auto is still like the top in the rank. Yeah, and then. How is there enough superchargers like the charging stations? Not enough. Okay. Not enough, and that's why, and that's why, um, and that's why, uh, hybrid became well one of the most popular options for a lot of the um right. for a lot of the new buy buyers yeah. because China is not yet like the U.S. Yeah. that you can supercharge your car anytime you want. Okay. Um. So having a hybrid makes more sense right now Got for it. now. Got uh. It. But in the longer run, when all these infrastructure are all built out. I'm sure that we'll all move into fully electric. Okay. Not everybody like me live in a place that I can have, you know, a, a charger. Right. Uh, for my own, for my own, um, you know, station. And then when you say like it's super popular and it's a best-selling SUV, we're talking about the main cities, are we? Or are we talking about across the entire country? Across the entire country. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, the second tier, third tier cities. Yeah. I mean, just buying. because of the fact that um, I'm not too sure if you know the statistics, right? Yeah. Um, every ten cars that is selling in China right now. Um, more than 30% are electric. Okay. And, you know, all the electrics are done by these three to five names in, yeah. in China. Yeah. So that's why they're so popular. Yeah. Um, so so uh, with 
a lot of government support and, and, and regulations encouraging that to happen. Yeah. Um, all the new cars buyers, you know, the first choice are now EVs. Okay. And how's Tesla doing there? Is Tesla that, is doing great. Okay. Yeah. So it's still a, it's still an exotic foreign brand. Ex ex exactly. Yeah. Just like Apple is doing great, yeah. and Tesla has been you know lowering the price you know on a quarterly basis to compete. Very competitive, okay. and that's why you know if people can afford, they will still pick Tesla. Uh, but there are a lot more other reasons to pick Xiaopeng and Li yeah. and yeah. and Neo and the other other brands as well. Yeah. Yeah, and the Chinese people are going pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, these two companies have both launched five cars models wow like they are like seven year old company think yeah. about that well, i know that's tesla amazing. right now has four models know, right? right you know the yeah. sexy right yeah. and they have you know four to five models each brand already yeah and that's how chinese entrepreneur evolve yeah you know they they want to be the fastest they yeah. want to be the biggest they want to offer you the best options around yeah so so they all started off with either sedan suvs yeah, right. and now they're evolving into mpvs they're evolving into what's uh, mpv uh, uh you know like like the alfred the oh, seven alfred, seater yeah, yeah, you know yeah. a family oh cars. yeah it's the famous family uh, car it's that, not a mini it's not a minivan what is it called what is that what is multi-purpose vehicles yeah so okay. it's called mpvs yeah. you know you know gl ba right gl8 is the yeah. most popular version in china right but it's like gas gasoline only yeah and uh when all these ev companies they came in to build their own uh ev to be super sexy yeah you know you want 10 screens in your in in, in your mpvs right right you know uh, super spoiled, uh, and and people will, will, will pick that. That's how spoiled Chinese people are. Okay, interesting. Right, you want the best, you know, user experience. Yeah. Um. Uh. When not only when driving. Yeah. When you're when you're a passenger. Yeah. Right. So there's so many things that nitty gritties that people are building. Yeah. Uh, that let you pick Chinese brands way more than like a Tesla. Tesla, because it doesn't have that many yeah, special features that's in it. Right. And then so, but the thing is. Not only the companies can iterate super fast on new new cars, yep. but the the market must also be able to absorb it. There must be a demand, so there must be a lot of interaction with the customers, mm. saying that we you know the consumers want a car with like ten screens in the back seat, yes. right? <laughs> is that right? Is that how they work? It, it is. It yeah. is. I mean, we. Uh, I, I think on on. In the in a normal year in China, there are twenty million cars being being sold, yeah. and 10, 10 millions of them, half of them were new cars. Ten millions were old, and yeah. of the ten millions, they will they they will pick the best ones, right? Right. And right. you know you know the market talks, and you know whoever is selling the best uh, means what they've done is right for the current consumer thing, right, right. consumer market. Yeah, everybody looks at the states and sees how fast something can grow, but in China, it's like out of control, out of control. how fast it can yeah, grow. Yeah, I, I think China right right now, nowadays, is the fastest growing EV industry in the Crazy. entire world. Crazy. Um, I think they will reach 45, 40, 50%, um, you know, new car penetration of by EVs wow. you know, very, very soon. So they're going to, yeah, that's amazing. So now that you've worked with so many Chinese founders and you've probably met tons of Western founders, you know, what do you see as a different, like one or two things that you see differentiate the way they think? Is it, is it the market itself? Because mm. I also hear a lot of competitors, like if there's two guys doing the same kind of business, they see each other, they, they want to beat each other. It's like a <laughs> game in that way, and that's what makes them super competitive. Yes. But is that what you see? Because you know, you're, we're, we're making products for lazy people, mm. but the founders are not lazy. Not they're lazy. like super yeah, hardcore. Super hardcore, super competitive. Yeah. We yeah. always talk about, you know, they work, you know, 724, yeah. you know, yeah. or 365 days. Yeah. Um, you know, they not only themselves, but the entire founding team and, yeah. and all, all the employees. Yeah. Um, that's how I see is the major difference. Okay. People really want to want to build the next big thing. Yeah. You know, they have ambitions and yeah. they really want to do it. Yeah. Um, and um, they, they, they work the hardest, you know, as hard as they can to, to yeah. build it. And they're super competitive. Not, yeah. not that, you know, um, so, so when we see, you know, when there's one thing that got built out and really works, yeah. there could be easily 20 competitors in the market. Right, right. Uh, because everybody wants to win. Yeah. And even as hard as it, we're, you're not building a food delivery app, yeah. even you're building EVs, which yeah. you need billions to, to, right. to build a car company. Right. And you can find that there are so many people yeah. doing it. Yeah. Because because the money is easy to find, and everybody, oh, the investors also want to win. The investors also want to win. Yeah. Yeah. And, they're, they're, and these are quality people. We're, we're coming into... You know, like you know, the second, third generations of um right. of uh, of uh, of entrepreneurs in China now. Yeah, when right. I started investing 20, yeah. 23 years ago, yeah, they were all fresh graduates. Yeah, you know, they just graduated. They're younger people now. The founders of Xiaopeng, Li Xiang, they're in the forties. Yeah, they're, they're the third companies that they've built. Yeah, the previous ones are wow. all multi-billion-dollar companies. Wow, and 
every iterations they want to build something bigger. Okay. Right. So so they are a lot more experienced, a lot more uh, you know that the 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 repeat entrepreneurs. Yeah. So it doesn't sound like it's about money. Something like Silicon Valley as well. It doesn't seem like they just do it for an exit. Yeah. They're actually doing it they, just to be, uh, they want to build the biggest company they, they, they can. They're all, to a certain extent, they're all billionaires, right? Already, yeah, right, already. So, already, yeah. Already, but they want, they want to build the next big thing. Yeah. Is it is it anything about just the competitive nature amongst the founders? Is it a country pride thing? Like, what, do you see anything else that comes into play I, I there? think it comes into, you know, the country and the culture itself. Yeah. You know, people has been not rich, not well known yeah. for for the longest time. Right. Now that there's a chance for you that you know when you work hard, there is a chance that you become one of the major entrepreneurs, you be on the main stage. Yeah. So people really want to be that. Not right. only to be rich, but also to be yeah. successful. Yeah. And and there's a stage for it. And yeah. why not? It's yeah. very, very different. Yeah. Uh, we're in a developing developing country, but you know, is the first generation entrepreneurs. Put yeah. it that way. Yeah. So I see a lot of uh, mainland Chinese founders coming to Silicon Valley, going to the States or going to Europe mm -hmm. and doing and competing in that market. But do you think that a, a Western, like an American or can North American founder, could they go to China and uh, my, be able to compete? My view will be very, very hard. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a country that is so unique yeah. uh, and, and closed. Yeah. So you need to be very much you know, drill yourself into the market before you can really understand it and build something for, for this market. Right. So um, it's very similar to what you see in Japan and Korea. Okay. Right. It's not China alone. It's right. just the entire ecosystem. Yeah. The culture is different. The language is different. The yeah. way that you work are different. Uh, yeah. you, you, you know, so, so even if we talk about stocks, right? Yeah. Reds are up. Greens yeah. are down. Yeah. Right? For China, right. you have to understand it. So, yeah. so right. it's very, very hard for, <laughs> you know, non-Chinese to come into China to play. Yeah. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely the rest of Asia is the same. It's a challenge for anybody to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, but it feels like it's because I guess in the U.S. is so international. I guess it's easier for a Japanese company to come into mm -hmm. the States and maybe take a shot at it yep. uh, because it's a bit more of an open market um, and it's culturally so diverse anyways. Yeah. Is that I what wouldn't you would say, say that China is not open. China really open yeah. arms and welcome a lot of people to come. Yeah. But just to be successful entrepreneurs, yeah. you know, my say is you need to be extremely local and understand the market. Right, right. So um, so, so that that's how we see for the last 20 something years. Yeah. You know, the, to the extreme, you know, if you're our... Uh, you know, from the U.S., you better be, you know, a Chinese American. Yeah. That you actually born and raised in China, but you become very successful in in the states. Yeah. And now you want to come back to China and 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 found your own company. Yeah. That right. still works. Yeah. Uh, we have now currently a bunch of newer generation entrepreneurs. Okay. That used to be the head of R and D for AMD, for Nvidia, okay. for NXP, Freescale, their semiconductor companies. Okay. Uh, now they are coming back to China to found their own chipset companies. Okay, so why don't they do it in the States? Why do they come back to the mainland? Because they could be at most the, the head of R and D. They will not be CEOs okay, and they cannot be a they cannot be like a founding member of a successful company. Okay. And there is a chance for you okay. to be right in, in China. And, um, you know, the world is changing, you know, yeah. the, how Chinese and U.S. are competing right now. Yeah. They're limiting, you know, chips that importing. Right. And we need our right. own version of so NVIDIA. The so there, there is yeah. the opportunities for all yeah. these CEOs to come back to, uh, oh, to, to to create the next big thing. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the pandemic as, and its effect. <laughs> I know we don't want to talk too much about it. Yes. But I feel like. I forgot. Do you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I, for, I forgot about those, two, forgot. those few years. Yeah. You told me all kinds of crazy stories about what happened. Yeah. Uh, the, the craziest story I think you told me is that you bought your own uh, fridge. Meat, fridge or meat fridge. locker, right? Yeah. Meat locker. Yeah. I don't know what's, well, how, how to pronounce it, but uh, literally 300 liters. Yeah. As big as yeah, like this table table, yeah. that I can hide my own that body inside <laughs> and close it. Yeah. So that that's what we did. But you for need, you for need that a... one week in yeah. China, uh, all meat lockers were sold out. Yeah. Everybody who can afford to have one yeah. got one wow. and have it all packed up with meat. Wow. Now that I'm overloaded with uh, <laughs> a lot of food that I need to wrap it up. <laughs> okay. But it, you did it because they were you couldn't go out to buy the fresh meat, uh, right? Not because of that. Because I live in Beijing. I don't live in Shanghai. Okay. I see what happened in Shanghai. Yeah. Everybody in Beijing was super scared about yeah. if the lockdown is coming into Beijing. Yeah. Are we going to have enough food? So yeah. we got ourselves prepared. Yeah. But luckily, that did not happen. Yeah. But, you know, all my friends are overloaded with meats and meat lockers right now. <laughs> so I have to find a way that, to... Uh, <laughs> I hope you didn't invest in any meat lockers. <laughs> Longer production companies because that's like the all that um, 
all the pandemic uh, yes, stuff yes. that they were selling so much of. So, but did it slow down your business, like investing in companies? a lot? Okay, a lot for for the year. Are you on Zoom calling the founders I, like I've everybody been on else? Zoom calls every day. Okay. It, it, when when it started off, we used to think that is like super sexy you yeah. know i don't need to go to work yeah. and then i can do 10 <laughs> meetings without the traffic yeah. instead of like two in beijing we have to yeah. sit in through traffic but after a while it doesn't really work i mean i i am in a, in a business that i have to interact with people yeah i have to have to see you you know in the face you know i have to yeah. talk casually it's yeah. not about pitches yeah. and listening to ideas only right? right right so you know getting to know these people uh from a more i would say you know intimate level yeah uh it's pretty much unable to do during the pandemic. Right. I could not be able to travel to Shanghai. Uh, you know, there are lockdowns here, lockdown there. You know, the city is being locked up for three weeks. And then and then, and then, then that happened to Shanghai, that happened to, to, to Shenzhen. So for almost nine months of time, you know, there were just a lot of Zoom calls. Yeah. But uh, it was counterproductive. Yeah. Uh, I could not be able to really read these people and know what they're doing. Right. So uh, business has been down quite a lot. Okay. Uh, but since China reopened, yeah. It's been resuming like crazy. Okay. Like, um, I don't see anyone in my office okay. after Monday. Okay. Right. Monday is like the regular, you know, you know, the, um, the, the weekly meetings that we do. Uh, we meet up and talk about deals and internal discussions. Yeah. And then once that is done, everybody's out. Okay. Traveling. Oh, traveling. Uh, okay. Traveling okay. to meet with companies. And that's like what it was before the pandemic. That right? was what it okay. was. It was even more, more severe because there's so many people that you have to catch up to. Catch, yeah. Um, yeah. There was a huge backlog of um, right. views that you have to, you have to visit, that, right. that people do you have to talk to. So you're saying in China, it wasn't like in the States where I feel like a lot of money was deployed over Zoom in 2021, <laughs> right? Like that was yes. uh, that was all our conference uh, VC talks were right, about right, this, right? right? So it wasn't like that there. It wasn't like that. Okay. I mean, we started off a little bit like that, uh, but that productivity actually came down. Okay. Um, and also to one extent, right? I mean, a lot of these companies, not that I need to face FaceTime with them, yeah. but at the same time, uh, we are evolving from more internet companies yeah. into, I would say, offline, um, real, real, real economy companies. Okay. I got to go offline to try a car, right? Yeah, if right. I'm investing right. in EVs, right. if I'm investing into robotics, I want to see how it works. I yeah. need to be in, in the factories. Yeah. If I cannot pay out those visas, yeah. it will be extremely hard for me to pull the trigger to invest in them. Okay. So um so so it's it's different. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Web three and crypto in China. <laughs> I think this is a big hot topic right now. Uh, we're we're recording this now in Hong Kong. Yep. You're in town for a big uh, Web three conference. Yes. Um, and uh, the talk uh, the talk of the world actually is focused on Hong Kong now. Yes. And that uh, Beijing is basically giving Hong Kong a green light to get back into crypto. Hundred percent. Is that how you read it? That's how I read it. Tell me, do, am I reading it right? <laughs> Hong Kong is independently run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hong Kong is like the Switzerland uh, so, uh, of China, right? That's right. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm personally from Hong Kong. Yeah. I, I, I do feel um, very happy uh, and blessed that Hong Kong now being positioned uh, as one of the Web3 hubs, um, yeah. you know, for, 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 for the Asia market. Yeah. Uh, and they're making a big thing out of it. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I do see a lot of people coming into China. Yeah. Uh, from China to Hong Kong yeah. in this particular conference. Yeah. I see all my old friends being, being in town. Yeah. And people are all very excited. Okay. So. Okay. Why are they excited? Because they know that, you know, there is a land. That that is with the arms <laughs> opening. Yeah, it belongs to China. It belongs to China. Uh, yeah. And 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 they can really perform. Okay. Right. So one one big thing that I want to to illustrate. Right. I mean, we for the last twenty years, we have built out a very sophisticated and uh, mature ecosystem of developers yeah. in the China market. Yeah. With all the all the more all the more more all the DD. Right. Yeah. So development team in China is still the best in town. Okay. Um. But then you you cannot do a lot of the um the blockchain. The crypto the yeah. web3 stuff then might as well have a dual office yeah you know have your development team in china and have a lot of the business development and your company headquarters based out in hong kong and have it facing the world um so that now becomes one of the norm and what people are trying to do yeah um and 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 and, and people are excited yeah one of the things i heard from the government uh, government department was that uh, Hong Kong is no longer the gateway to China, but it is the gateway for China to the world, specifically in Web3. What do you think about that? It, uh, it's a good way to position yeah. it. I, I think, you know, Chinese, chi China um, actually welcomes blockchain, yeah. right? It's a lot of blockchain oh, companies okay. in China. We have ERMB okay. um, actually launched. Yeah. So there are a lot of blockchain 
blockchain technology. It doesn't, being, but it doesn't want deployed. the Western uh, it does not bitcoins want and tokenization, Ethereum. cryptocurrencies okay. uh, that would jeopardize a lot of the um, the, the no, not free flow of RMB and things like that. Right, right. A lot of capital controls and stuff like that right. needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, Hong Kong being situated, uh, you know, as part of China. But with the opening to the world, yeah. um, is actually being quite well positioned yeah. uh, to to be able to to benefit from yeah. this. Okay, so aside from the startup world, you know, looking at the crypto market, do you think there'll be a lot of become a funnel? A lot of the mainland people are inter interested in crypto or trading crypto will come to Hong Kong, either set up an office here or set up an exchange here, yep. or make it a, a point of. There, there, it's already uh, a whole bunch of, um, I would say, Chinese entrepreneurs yeah. uh, that move from China to Singapore, I would say, yes. half a year and a year yeah. ago, um, to, to, to lend themselves there to be a Web3 company yeah. facing the world. Right. Uh, but now that Ch Hong Kong opens their arms and welcoming people to come back, I do see that a lot of people are actually coming back okay. to China. Okay. What I classify as Hong Kong is still part of China, yeah, yeah, uh, because it's a lot more convenient, yeah, a lot more welcoming, yeah, a lot more you know friendly for poor, for, for poor Singapore. They're not friendly and they're not welcoming. <laughs> yeah. And Dubai too, right? Dubai was the other hot spot. Yeah, a lot of people from mainland and also Hong Kong moved move, there, moved there because well, mostly because pandemic, right? Because yes. uh, they want to travel, they want to be not yeah, be back potentially then, locked still down, could not be able yeah. to travel, right? Yeah, yeah. So, now that things has changed quite a lot, yeah. So I do see that there will be a lot of Chinese people. Uh, you know, choosing themselves to come back and move back to Hong Kong. Now, is that basically because that it's easier for them to come here? Or do you think it's because of this new regulations that are happening? Totally is a combination of everything. Okay. You know, you have to come, uh, you have to have the government to, to, to embrace it. You have to have a back end of the Shenzhen and the Shanghai to help you to do development. Mm -hmm. It's much closer, mm -hmm. right? Think about if you have a dual offices, if, if one is in Singapore, one is in Shanghai. Yeah. Every flight is seven hours. How can you manage those teams? Right, right. But in Hong Kong, you can do day trips. Yeah. Right. There right. are a lot of things that are a lot more interactive, a lot of, um, you know, the, the much more easier to manage. So for all these reasons adding up together, I, I, I think, you know, Hong Kong will be born mm -hmm. and there will be a lot more, uh, you know, companies uh, building up the, the ecosystems that way. Okay. Where do you, in China do you think are like the hotspots for Web3 development developers? That are there now. A lot of them were in Hangzhou, in Shanghai, and Hangzhou, Shenzhen. Hangzhou, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. Okay, Shenzhen yeah. is literally Shenzhen is uh, MTR right away. A, exactly. Wow. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And do you see? Do you think that the big companies there, like the Ten Cents and the Byte Dances, they will start to move into? I Web do three, think so. Somewhere? I mean, I was at the conference. Yeah. You know, I was just talking to one of our portfolio company CEOs. So okay. Tell me what's your observation. Yeah. So one of the observations that he told me was. In this conference, which used to be only Web3 companies, yeah. right? Web3 projects, VCs and investors and projects, right? But we've got Ali Cloud, we've got Tencent Cloud, we've got a number of traditional Web2 companies. They are they exhibiting are there, there, right? Yeah, yeah they, they, they want to welcome Web3. They want to embrace it. They want to find a way to work with these new companies uh, in town, yeah. the new kids in the block. So, yeah, um, right. so they're all trying to come into the conference and exhibit. Yeah. Can you tell me like what kind of projects are they working on? They're not just doing NFTs, right? They're actually going to use blockchain technology to do things other than DeFi. Are they? Or are they? Yes. I mean, for, <laughs> I for, for, for the ones that I, I looked at, yeah. um, what I like to do is to build the infrastructure okay. uh, that can connect the current Web 2 world with the Web 3 world, okay. uh, which I think is the most important. Okay. I don't want to invest into a lot of, you know, I would say DeFi as, you know, protocols, yeah. you know, second layer, you know, yep. DeFi. Yep. These, these are These are good. But on the other hand, I think, you know, what we really want to do is to build the right infrastructure to enable a normal person like yeah. you and me yeah. to be yeah. able to get into the Web3 world. Web3 world right? right. I mean, I, I, I mean, Bitcoin has been around for yeah. 10, 13 years. Right. right. And why is it so hard for you to buy one? Right. Exactly. Right. Do you know how to buy one? Yeah. I do, uh, yeah. Uh, do you know how to store one? Yeah. Uh, but I'm know, scared of being stolen yeah, all the time. So though. you're scared of being stolen, <laughs> stolen the custodian solutions. Yeah. You have to you have to memorize your sit phrase and, yeah. and all these uh, all this stuff. Right. Which should not happen. Yeah. Which should be seamless. Right. You should be username and password. Yeah. You should be there. There's proper custodian solutions yeah. like the current banking system. Yeah. So we need these infrastructures to be built. Yeah. And what I believe from from my point of view is we we want to build and invest in these infrastructure to enable the next. Hundred million people yeah. to come into this world, okay. and uh, there there are 
you know, uh, wallet companies, they're okay. trading companies, they're okay. analytical companies, okay. uh, there are middleware API companies. Okay. Um, so, so, so in the future, all these could be as easy okay. as you just register for an Uber. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that is what we need. But have you seen any products that are coming out? Do you think that people are working on? I know like Animoca is working a lot of blockchain gaming. Yeah. And I can see how that works gaming immediately. Gaming is going right? to be the first phase. Okay. Because I've been, been through Web 1 and Web 2 and Web 3 well. Right. Um, Every time when there's a new web coming out, yeah. gaming is always, always the first. Or porn. Yeah. These, or are two <laughs> These are two things, right? Yeah, because it's the easiest for you to um, to, 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 to get into it, right. uh, to play with it, you know, to, w w without the, the lowest entry barrier. Yeah, right. So um, blockchain gaming yeah. uh, with NFTs, with tokenization yeah. is going to help, you know, a, a lot of, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of users uh to experience okay. uh, what cryptocurrency is, yeah. what blockchain gaming is going to be. And then that will eventually evolve into the future of, you know, the the, the, the blockchain of DD, the blockchain of Facebook, mm. the blockchain of whatever that has yeah. been created in the Web2 world, right, right. or even more. So, you're, so just to clarify, you're saying that developers can work on these kind of products in China. They just cannot launch them in China. They come through Hong Kong to launch them to the tokenization the world. is not allowed in China. Okay, so you cannot fundraise uh, from from uh, you know sure. um, the, the, the the public market. Yeah, but development is totally fine. Yeah, yeah I mean even Facebook, Google, they have developments in China, yeah. although they are not allowed to access it. So yeah. being a okay. development company is okay. totally fine. Yeah, um, but um, but uh, the the business side has to be outside. Okay, so what what do you think Hong Kong's opportunity here is here with all these companies that you're looking at right now? Mm. What's what's the opportunity for other companies like maybe be an American company that wants to move to Hong Kong and kind of like tap into developers in China, but, you know, build here. I, I, I think it will be the other way around. Okay. It will be a bunch of traditional Web2 application developers that wants to move into the Web3 world uh -huh. will now launch themselves into Hong Kong as the base and still use the existing dev development team in China okay. and to launch a product to face the world. Okay. I want to know, so you're at this conference, you're meeting a lot of people from mainland China in Hong Kong now. Mm. What's the vibe that you're getting about Hong Kong? I think this is the thing because a lot of people are reading on the news now. Hong Kong is opening up, mm. regulations, yep. uh, exchanges are, you know, everything's getting more exciting. I heard there was going to be a, uh, t not a token, but um, they're going to do something with them. Stable coins. Stable from, coins, from, right. For stable coins, right? right? Yeah, yep, for Hong that's Kong. Right. So what, what is the, is that why people mainland are getting excited to come here? And what about the Hong Kong people that you talk to? Uh, good, good, good questions. I, I, I think a lot of people are still trying to understand. Uh, what is really happening to yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah. Although I kind of like being a Hong Kong person, I, I yeah. read it more yeah. and, and I have a better feeling. Uh, but they have been to Singapore and they know, you know, it's not that real, right? <laughs> so is Hong Kong this time is going to be real? Got it, you yeah. know, you've got all these yeah. advertising, your yeah. open arms, but you know, how long is going to last? Yeah. Is it really going to build a real ecosystem in the right. market? Right. Um, so they're going through this process. Yeah. Uh, but I do see that the commitment from all the way up top from the government yeah. is really there. Okay. I mean, you see, you seldom see John Lee, Paul Chan, yeah. you know Peter from Cyberport. Yeah. You know, everybody was yeah. like, you know, there. Yeah. You know, you know, saying that you know we're gonna go all in Web three. You know, yeah. it, it's just a conference. Yeah. Why would they all be here? Right. 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 So it, that actually shows the commitment from yeah. top down yeah. that the government wants to build it. Yeah. Uh, you know, Hong Kong, they have a plan for it. Yeah. And um, I, I I do have quite a number of friends that are working in you know, different, different, um, you know, uh, uh, within the government entities, financial services, yep. HKMA, SFCs, and things like that, uh, through conversations with them, yeah. I do actually can feel like that they, they have a plan. Yeah. Uh, they want Hong Kong to be the major financial hub, not only for the traditional world, but also for the future of digital economy. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a tech conference. It was like a press conference, right? Yes. Everyone's tell they're telling basically the world because I saw a lot of the coverage on international media sites specific to crypto yep. about what was being said there from the government. So I think that's it was very right. vocal. Yeah, yeah, they've never been that vocal so yeah, <laughs> before never about anything. And to yeah. be honest, right? But, but that very is good. Like, that's, that is good in a way yeah. that you know they know what Web three is. Yeah, you know, Web three is not about you know is is not about you sitting there yeah. and then you know just talking to um to 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 uh, legislation. And then and then and then putting out the rules. Right. It's really interacting right. uh with the newer generation. It's really yeah. understanding what is needed. And yeah. they they I can feel that they're a lot more reactive. Yeah. They're, they're working a lot more faster. Yeah. Um, they're a lot more vocal. And this is all very web free. Yeah. In a way. Right. You 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 see John Lee posting on Facebook, on yeah. Twitter. Yeah. 
what, what, you know, when was the last time that, uh, you know, a, China, a Hong Kong CEO did that? Yeah, right, right, right. right. <laughs> I know, that's very strange. So what do you think the chances of, are of something like a Binance coming to Hong Kong? I, I think it will happen. Yeah, okay. It will happen. You know, from what I read, from what I what I see, uh, there will be I agree. there will be um, licenses being yeah. issued yeah. Uh, for proper, um, I would say, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges to be launched in Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the the number of them. Yeah. Uh, but the government is really working on it. Yeah. It will be in the second half of this year. Yeah. And then it will initially be more like spot trading. Yeah. In only the major coins. Sure. sure. And then eventually it's loosen up, yeah. opening up into other more exotic yeah. items and things. Right. Like that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, <laughs> exotic items. Options, derivative, altcoins, yeah. and, and whatever. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. Fi Hong Kong, as long as I've been here, as long as you've been here, it's been a financial hub, yes. right? The real traditional finance market here is massive, right? It's not a really an artistic city as it, oh, it wasn't an artistic. Mm -hmm. Now it's become an artistic yes. city, right? <laughs> um, but before it wasn't. So I feel like a lot of influx of capital. Uh, you're just think, thinking, how can they miss this opportunity, right? Mm. I feel like this has got to be something that Hong Kong is definitely going to go go into all in. Yeah, I, I, I truly believe into, you know, doing what is right at the right moment, right? Yeah. Because I was in China you know, like 20 years ago, yeah. riding the wave up for, yeah. the, for the last 20 plus years. Um, the next phase of Hong Kong, five to 10 years, I'm really bullish about it. Yeah. I, I think they're at the right place at the right moment. And yeah. it, 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 it strategically fit into what Hong Kong is good at, yeah. facing the world, being the gateway, uh, being international, being financial hub, but for the new economy. So long, <laughs> long, long Hong, Hong Kong. Kong. <laughs> That's it. That's the perfect ending. No need to say anything else after that. Yeah. Great. Thank, thanks, you, Harry. Thanks a lot. No thanks problem. Lot. Thanks a lot. Okay. You've been experiencing Super Excited with Casey Lau. Download Super Excited on your favorite podcast app now.